Well, I'm glad you're here today. We are kicking off a brand new six-week series called Unstuck. Anybody ever been stuck before? Maybe you got stuck because of some decision you made. Maybe you got stuck because of some circumstances you allowed yourself to get caught up in. Maybe you, got, maybe you just got stuck in the backwash of somebody else's circumstances and decisions. But nonetheless, you were stuck. It happens in all kinds of ways. I got stuck bad once and couldn't get myself out of it. I was driving to school my senior year. I had my two younger sisters in my dad's uh, pickup truck. It had snowed, and the snow had melted off, and I was driving to school in the hills of southern Ohio, but as I rounded this one bend, the uh, road had been kind of like semi-permanently shaded because of a big hill, and so while it was warm enough for some of it to melt off, since it wasn't getting sun directly there, overnight, that melt-off had turned to... And while I was being pretty cautious, as my sisters even vouched for me, I hit that ice, and I went zigzagging down the road. I was trying to remember everything they had taught me in driver's ed. I did the best I could, but I still went over the bank. I was headed for the river, except between me and the river was an oak tree. And what I couldn't tell, because of all the foliage or the fallen leaves on the ground there in the, in the woods, is right before I hit that oak tree, the frame of the truck got hung up on a steep bank. And my sisters and I were stuck. And I could not back out. I put it in a four-wheel drive. I could not get out. I tried to get my younger sister. You hit the gas, I'll push the truck. I couldn't push it out. There was a sawmill nearby. They knew my dad. They recognized the truck. They came over. And they took one of their loaders and pulled me out of the circumstances that I was stuck in. Now, sometimes in life, we get stuck in circumstances, even if we're being careful. Sometimes when we're uncareful, sometimes because of other people's things, sometimes just because we live in a sin-stained world, we get stuck. The question is not if you're ever going to get stuck because you either are, have, or will. It's how are you going to get unstuck, and if you're looking at the back of your worship folder or the front of it, somewhere in there, it tells you a series we're entering into. And we're going to walk through a whole series of ways that we get stuck and how to get unstuck in some of those norms in life. But this morning, we're talking about something that is very, very personal. Because when you get stuck, the one thing you look for is hope, Right? When I got stuck and I couldn't get myself out, when I saw those, over, those people and I saw that loader coming, I had hope that I could get unstuck. Well, in that was a literal sense, but in some of the more tangible senses in life, the topic we're discussing today is very direct, very personal. When we make bad choices that lead to devastating consequences, where do we find our hope? Now, if you have your Bible or you have a smartphone or you have an iPad or you've got like a word processor or anything with an app on it, or you've actually got a literal Bible, if you've got that, I want you to turn to a very famous story found in the New Testament. The Bible's divided into two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Go to the New Testament, hang a right. You've got kind of some names of books that have men's uh, names assigned to them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These aren't their personal biographies. These are their uh, interactions with Jesus and their understanding of him and his teachings. Go to the third book called Luke. We're going to go to Luke chapter 15 and do something I have never done in my entire life in ministry. I'm actually going to read the whole chapter here this morning as we weave our way through this conversation. But many of the messes in our own life are our own making. How many of you live long enough to appreciate that? They're our own making. And so we're going to look at this famous story that we generically call the prodigal son. But before we jump into that story, I want to go ahead and give you the definitions of some of the things you're going to see in that story because they were writing to an audience that understood that, but they're terms that we don't use today. Like you're going to see a couple of terms like uh, Pharisees and teachers of the law. We don't necessarily use those terms in everyday American life today. Would you agree? So what is a Pharisee? A Pharisee was actually someone who was devoutly religious, committed to God. They lived according to God's law that was found in the early uh, pages of Scripture, like in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and some of those earliest books from the Old Testament. And then what happened was they got so zealous 
that they started paying more attention to the letter of the law than the God who had given them the law. And then to prove that they were better religiously than other people, they started adding some more stuff on top of what God had given them that God never intended. And so they became Pharisees. They were legalistic. They were like the Navy SEALs of, of Bible police. I mean, they were like the Bible watchdogs. And they were horrible and very, very sad human beings. And then there's a group called the teachers of the law. We don't really teach the law today. But basically they were men who had given themselves to the understanding of the scriptures and then used to teach others. So today you might say a seminary professor or a pastor or a missionary on foreign soil would be along those lines. And then there are two other terms in there that if you don't identify with the Pharisees and you don't identify with the teachers of the law, maybe you identify with one of these two. Sinners and tax collectors. Now, in this terminology, according to this conversation, in the context of this scripture, Jesus was talking to a group of Pharisees and teachers of the law. That was his audience. Are you with me? So he's getting very pointed. They were upset that Jesus was hanging out with those kinds of people. They accused him of being a friend of sinners. Now, what was the sinner? In this particular context, in this particular conversation, right there in that particular neighborhood, they were upset because Jesus was hanging out with women who had grown up in the Jewish faith tradition, had heard the teachers of the law espouse and the Pharisees, Pharisee and whatever it is they do, and had gone off to um, get involved with lifestyles of ill repute. Do I need to define that any further? Some of you got it, right? Some of you are going, I can't spell repute. That's okay. You're in the right place. And then there were tax collectors. Tax collectors were despised because here was a tax collector. These were Jewish people living under the oppression of the Roman government. And the tax collector was the Jewish man who would go and collect taxes from Jewish people to give to the Roman government. And they were hated like crazy. So you got the backdrop, you got some of the working knowledge. So let's kind of take a stroll through this passage found in Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 1. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes, parenthetically you could almost say, this man welcomes instead of avoiding sinners and he eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable, this story, to try to give them an analogy of what was going on and let them see his heart. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Or does he hang around and say, oh good, I still got 99? No, he goes and finds it. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. So I tell you that in the same kind of way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who, what's the word? Talk to me. Repent. Repents. Not one sinner who is found, not one sinner who wandered off but is accounted for, but one sinner who, Repents. underline that word there. If you've got a highlighter in your digital device, highlight it. That's going to be important throughout this morning's conversation. Then over 99 righteous per persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she walk around saying, I still got 90% of my net worth. Life is good. No. Does she not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and contacts them on Facebook and together. And they say, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, religious leaders, Pharisees, and teachers of the law, because that's who his audience was, there is the rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who, are you beginning to see a theme? Hang on to it. Underline it there. So Jesus has talked to them about two material articles. Now he makes it a little more personal. He talks to them about this rebel son, the son with a rebellious spirit. Jesus goes on to say, there was, a young, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger one said to his father, Father, 
give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. Now let's pause right there. He had two sons. So the way it was back then, because this wasn't particularly a kid-friendly society like the one we live in, you got this punk son, this rebel kid, who basically understood that he had an older brother, that when dad died, according to the, the, the law and the norms of the day, the younger son would get two-thirds of dad's estate, and he, as the younger son, would get one-third of dad's estate. The older son would always have more and have it better, and he had developed this re rebellious attitude. And he was so frustrated with it all that basically what he said is, Dad, I no longer have any need for you. It, you might, it's in my mind, Dad, you're dead. Why don't you just go ahead and give me what's mine? Now, his dad, because quite frankly, in that culture, children were subjects to their fathers. The dad could have actually had him put in prison, could have had him flogged. Depending on how hard the son pressed, could have had his son killed and no one would have said a thing about it. Dad, I don't need you anymore. I wish you were dead. Give me what you're going to give me anyway as if you had already died and I had celebrated your funeral. And now, Dad, I want to go do my own thing. His dad divided the property between them and gave him his, his inheritance. And then not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and he set off for Las Vegas and squandered it there in wealth and wild living. Well, I could explain wild living, but, you know, Vegas fits, right? And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out as a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. Now, let's pause right there. Do you guys know anything about Jewish law and pork? Now, Jewish law says that they, not only that they should never eat pork, but they consider the pig, the producer of pork, <laughs> to be unclean. That they should never be near them. They should never touch them. If you were to touch a pig, even accidentally, you tripped and fell and one just happened to be walking along the road beside you you would have to go through this elaborate seven-day ceremonial cleansing process. Do you see any irony in a Jewish teenager taking millions of dollars, blowing it in Las Vegas, and having to hang out, basically the next verse says, as the waiter to the pigs? You hogs need anything else? I'm at your service. My name is. Are you with me? You beginning to see some of the muck and the mire that this young man's gotten himself into? And he was hungry, and he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So he's hungry, he's desperate, he's destitute, he's hanging out with unclean, with filth. He can't imagine life being any worse. And then verse 17 is the key verse in this entire story. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? Here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And because of that, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. Now, the reason I said that is the key sentence in this entire story is because he, it says when he came to his... See, folks, he came to a, a level of self-awareness where he understood that the struggle that he was stuck in was based on his own choices and he was living out the consequences. And the first step... And overcoming the struggles that you are stuck in in life is taking personal and full responsibility for your choices and decisions that led to those consequences. Somebody should be screaming at the top of their voice, I've got children, that's good preaching. <laughs> First step in full repentance is owning your choices, your behavior, your sin. And then verse 20, and so he got up and he went to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him 
and was filled with compassion for him. So he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. Now, I grew up in church. I was very blessed to grow up in a Christian home and a great family-oriented church. And most of my life, I had heard that Every day after this kid took off, dad did nothing but go out to the end of the driveway and stand by the mailbox and look to see if he could find his son. And I, and I got to study this for myself and found out nothing could be further from the truth. Maybe some of you grew up in a Christian home or went to Sunday school and you heard, yeah, dad just basically wasted the rest of his life standing there staring, looking for his son. It's not true. We'll learn here a little bit later. Dad actually thought the kid went off and had died and was going on with his life. You still with me? How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? Okay. It gets really interesting here. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. And then here's how I know what I'm telling you is true. For this son of mine was dead. And now he's alive again. Now, any father who's had a son that maybe went off in the military and never came home with the rest of his troop, who you had a kid who took off on his motorcycle and he was 19 years old and they haven't heard from him for the last 20 years, you can assume they're dead, but until you actually see the body, you always have what? Hope. So this dad assumed his son was dead. That doesn't mean that he didn't occasionally glance. And one day he is glancing. He looks up from whatever he's working on and he squints and takes his glasses off. And is, is that wild child? I mean, the gait looks familiar. The way he walks, the, the hair, the little familiar. He's a little skinny, but I think that's, I think that's wild child. And then he does something that it was not, jogging was not in vogue. He hikes up his wardrobe and he runs and lays one of those big sloppy Middle Eastern kisses on his son's cheek. And he welcomes him in and he says, let's put a robe on him and let's get him bathed and let's put a ring on his finger. He's still my son and let's have a, a great party. We're going to celebrate like crazy because my son, I thought all these years was dead. It turns out he's alive. And let's celebrate. And they did. But meanwhile, the older son was in the field. Now, the older son, by this time, is a little bit older, meaning he's probably, dad owned whatever level of estate. It wasn't like he had, you know, a 10,000 square foot lot with a pool and a 50, you know, 2,500 square foot house. I mean, he owned acres for miles. The son had already married. He was already living on one of the backfields, taking care of other stuff that was still his dad's, but part of his responsibility. It wasn't like dad could just send him a text and say, hey, your brother's back. <laughs> You know, and it wasn't like the, son was, the, the older son was stopping every five minutes and laying down his job and going on Instagram and saying, well, let's see if my kid, my kid brother came back yet. And when he, heard, when he came near the house, he heard the music and the dancing. Now, how loud do your feet have to be moving for somebody to hear it from outside? You guys complain about the sound in here. That's a party. <laughs> and so he called one of the servants and asked him, what in the world's going on? Well, your brother... Has come, he replied, and your father killed the fattened calf, and because of that, he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother got mad, and he refused to go in, and so his father went out and pleaded with him. And but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, and I have never one time disobeyed your orders. But you never gave me so much as a young goat that I could throw a Super Bowl party with my friends. But when this son of yours, not my brother, notice the terminology here, not my brother, but this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And what's the word? Everything. Everything I have. Underline the word everything. I have is yours. In other words, yes, your son's back. We, yes, we gave him, let him take a shower and we gave him a new robe and we gave him sandals and we gave him a ring and he's getting to eat some steak. 
But it's not like he's going to get a second bite out of the inheritance apple. Everything, that's, that's as good as it gets for him. We're just celebrating the fact that he's alive. Everything else is still yours. Did you catch that? And we celebrate and be glad because your brother who was dead is alive again. Your brother who was lost is now found. See, this younger brother is back. And he gets a party and he gets a ring. But that's it. He doesn't get any more inheritance. It's not like dad's going to go back and take the two-thirds of the state that's left and re-divide it up. This is as good as it's going to get for the younger brother. And Jesus is telling this to the scholars and to the Pharisees because he's saying, I want you to understand my heart is for you. You're still going to get everything. Yes, you've made some mistakes, but you're still my teachers and you still study my scriptures and you're still trying to live according to my father's plan. But all of these other people out here who have made messes out of their lives, I have a heart for them. And you can accuse me of hanging out with them because it doesn't match up with everything you think you're going to get and everything you believe. But my heart is for the people who are going to die separated from me. And what I want to do is we kick off this series this morning. This morning we're going to talk to you about five things that we kind of mess up in life. And the mess is our own makings. And when you come face to face with the reality of that situation, where do you find hope that God wants to offer? Let's jump right in. Number one, there in your outline, it's on the screen behind me. No mess is too big for a miracle. No mess is too big for a miracle. That's why Jesus came, because you are never beyond the reach of God's love and God's grace. Never. In Luke chapter 15, we just read the story of the prodigal son. If you go back a few uh, chapters in Luke to Luke chapter 5, the verses there in your outline, Jesus says this, I did not come to call. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus says, look, I'm not interested in just finding people. I'm interested in them repenting. There's that word again, right? It's a word Jesus uses pretty commonly. See, folks, whatever you need God to do in your life, personally, familially, vocationally, always begins with personal repentance. Now, I'm going to give you fair warning, okay? It's going to get tense in here this morning. If you have a problem with tension, this is a really good time for you to act like you have to go to the bathroom, but go get your kids out of children's church and go have a late breakfast or an early lunch. Any takers? It's going to get tense. What I'm going to talk to you about this morning has nothing to do, I'm going to be an equal opportunity offender, okay? Regardless of your age, regardless of your ethnicity or race, regardless of which side of the aisle you fall onto politically speaking. We're going to lay aside all of that stuff and everything I'm discussing this morning is going to come strictly out of the word of God. So if I say something that you say, because of my age, that offends me. It's not my issue. It's the Bible's issue. I'm just telling you. It's not a race issue. It's a Bible issue. It's not a political issue. It's a Bible issue. It's not an ideology issue or an issue of the family you grew up in. It is a biblical issue issue. Raise your right hand. Everybody, I solemnly swear that we are going to take a clear look at God's word, regardless of my age, regardless of my race, regardless of my political affiliation. And I will still love David at the end, so help me God. Amen. So I've got good news and I've got bad news for you this morning. We're going to start with the bad news so we can end on a high note, okay? Let's jump right into thought number two. With the understanding 
that no mess is too big for a miracle because that's absolutely biblical and true. Number two says, but God doesn't always respond when we cry for help. You're like, what? Wait, David, you're a pastor. You're supposed to tell me that God loves me and that he'll help rescue me from any situation I get myself into and, um, and then we'll go get ice cream because Jesus is a benevolent grandfather. Do y'all remember this? Go to the next slide for me. Do y'all remember that? What stands for? Tell me, what's it stand for? Talk to me. Okay, now I've seen that, and I get the sentiment behind it. I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not dissing that. But every once in a while, I thought we would understand what Jesus would do when we take a look at what Jesus already has done. Because you face future behavior and past behavior. Jesus says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we would understand that he is consistent in his character, in his teaching, in his behaviors. Well, what did Jesus do? Again, we think of Jesus or God as this benevolent grandfather. I'm so sorry. Okay, let's go to the Dairy Queen or we're in a foxhole and say, God, if, you'll do, if I do this, will you do this? And God, if you'll do this, then I'll do this. And we make deals with God. And I want you to understand something. God wants a relationship with us, but he is not incomplete without us. He absolutely wants a relationship so much that he sent his son to die. But God in heaven is not incomplete without David Harris or you. In fact, there's a line in your notes that says this. If we want a life without God, he'll let us have a life without God. God is not a puppet master controlling every situation, every decision, every choice, every behavior in your life just to, so you will choose him. He gives you the freedom of choice. It's like the son and his inheritance. The son has his inheritance. He could have gone out and invested it. He could have gone out and drilled a new oil well. He could have gone out and done whatever it is he could have done and actually prospered in life instead of making the choice to waste his life. His dad wasn't standing around waiting and sending out people looking for him, but he was available. His dad had kind of closed that door, but he never locked the door to the relationship. And this is something we see in the New Testament and the Old Testament. Psalm chapter 81 says these words. But my people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own desires. It's kind of like what's going on in the United States today. There are certain things that have become culturally and politically and socially acceptable that are the desires of the hearts of mankind but have nothing to do with the desire of the heart of the Father. And God says, you don't want a relationship with me? I want one with you, but I won't force you to do that. I love you too much to treat you like a puppet on the string. That's why I made you in my image. You get to choose. I'll give you every advantage possible. You get to choose. And we see this going on in the United States. And God's saying, if you want to do it your way, great, do it your way. You know what else we see? We see it going on in too many churches in the United States. They're doing church. They're just leaving God and Jesus clear out of it. You want to do it your way? Do it your way. If you want a life without me, God says, I'll let you have a life without me. Which leads me to the second thought there. If we refuse to listen, God will refuse to help. This isn't in your notes, but I'm going to grab my Bible and jump over to the Old Testament book of Proverbs. It's about halfway into the Old Testament, just after the book of Psalms, if some of you want to find it, or you can go to the... Um, whatever it is, your, your glossary or whatever, and your, Bible, your table of contents on your Bible app. And go to Proverbs chapter 1 and take a look there beginning at verse number 24. Here's what the writer says. But since you rejected me when I called, and no one gave heed when I stretched out my hand, since you ignored all my advice and would not accept my rebuke, I in turn will laugh at your disaster. Now, God's not talking about disaster like is going on in Florida this morning in Texas last week. 
God's talking about the disaster that falls upon us personally and behaviorally based on the choices that we make, especially when those choices say, God, I don't need you. I'll do it my way. I want to pursue my life and you stay out of it. Now, I'm also thinking, imagine that you come to me this week. You make an appointment, we sit down and we have a conversation over a cup of coffee. And you've got some brokenness going on in your life where you're stuck. And after you spend 45 minutes genuinely pouring your heart out to me, I look at you and I laugh in your face. You're probably not coming back next week, are you? Probably going to immediately go to social media and tell everybody what a bad person I am. Because no matter what I'm thinking or feeling, I can't do that. I might disagree with you. I might challenge your thinking. I might confront your behaviors. But if I laugh at you, that's pretty disrespectful, right? How bad must it be for God to say, based on all of your choices, all of your behaviors, and all of the things that you are doing that go contrary to what I am teaching, I'm just going to laugh at you. <laughs> and that's what the Bible says, right? And then, this, then it continues there in Proverbs. And it says, when calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you, then they will call to me, but I will not answer. Then they will look for me, but will not find me. Since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurn my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. God's just saying, hey, um, here's what God's saying. In life, just having remorse and crying out to God for help is not enough. The son went back to his dad. The son said, dad, I am sorry. I have sinned against you. The son came back hungry. And then what did the son do next? The son owned it. The son came to his senses. The son said, I have brought all this on myself. Now I have to go home and face the consequences. And then after making that decision, he actually had to exercise, live out the behaviors that supported that decision, and he had to take the long journey back home. Just saying, I'm sorry, just crying out, I'll never do it again, doesn't change the situation. At some point in time, you have to turn and start making the journey back home. You have to own it. Now, that section is mostly the bad news. Are you ready for some good news this morning? Good, because I got a lot of that. Number three is this. God always responds when we repent. God always responds when we repent. Now, here's what I want you to understand real quick. Three things about repentance. Number one, remorse is not repentance. Repentance is kind of a churchy word, right? You don't hear that a lot. You don't go to your, your boss at work and say, you know, I, I, I was supposed to finish that project. Boss, I repent. <laughs> right? It's kind of a churchy word. So what is repentance? Next two lines will tell us. Repentance means taking full responsibility. Taking full responsibility for my actions and for these consequences. Now, folks, I want you to hear me. We never get out of the weeds. We never get pulled out of the pit. Or in my case, your truck never gets pulled off of the hillside when we play the blame game that is so common in our culture. You know, nobody's a rebel, but everybody's a victim. It was always my parents' fault, or that's the environment's fault, or my kid was hanging around with the wrong crowd, or I hung around with the wrong crowd, or it's my genetic, my genetic makeup, or it's my ethnicity, or it's you. you. It's what you did to me. Nobody is a rebel. Everybody's a victim because we always blame somebody else for our issues. And whatever we've done, the natural response is, not my fault. 
And I will never move beyond myself until I can look in the mirror and I can say, yes, it is my fault and I have to accept these consequences. Let me give you an example from my own family so I don't, I don't offend your family. Two years ago, I got called by my mom, had to come home, fly home to Ohio quick. My dad was having a quadruple bypass. And we gather around my dad and we prayed with my dad and we prayed for the doctors and we prayed for dad's health and healing and asked God to be merciful and gracious in all of that. Same kind of things you would pray, right? 100% appropriate. But when I take one step back, I have to appreciate that my dad in the main, having a quadruple bypass at age 75, was the natural consequence of a man who ate nothing but fried food his whole life, would pig out on ice cream, potato chips, and cookies all night long, every night, was 60 pounds overweight all of his life. And this was the sum total of his lifetime of choices. You are you with me? Basically, my dad, his entire life, who was a Christian, served on his church board, said when it comes to the Bible's teaching about what is appropriate diet and health, and when it comes to my doctor's qualified opinion on what I should and shouldn't eat and how much I should and shouldn't exercise, dad says, no, I got this. I can handle it on my own. Now, we're not thinking that when my dad's laying there recovering from a quadruple bypass. We're thinking about his health, asking God for mercy. But it is the devastating consequences to my dad's lifelong bad choices. It's like somebody sits in front of me and says, David, my, my, my family's struggling financially. We're just, just not sure we're going to be able to make it. And in the course of the conversation, as we start fleshing that out, I will ask them at some point, have you been living according to God's financial plan? Well, no, not really. Well, not really, just basically is no, I just don't want to have to own it. And so what they're asking me to do is pray a prayer that says, God, I have completely ignored your teaching. I have ignored your word. And I have said, God, I don't need you. I can go handle my money however I want my way. And when they get into a mess, come back and ask me to pray that God will bless what they have done. I can't help that you chose to ignore God's teaching on debt and got yourself into maxed out credit cards. I can't help that you chose to ignore God's teaching on giving the first 10% to him first through the local church. And God promises blessings, but you said, no, God, you're a liar. I got this. I'll manage my money. You stay out of it. Is it getting tense in here? Let me take it a step further. I know. We haven't seen the pictures yet, but they're coming because you base future behavior on past behavior unless there's crisis or intervention, right? Every parent goes, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I know, we're getting ready to get, sh get shots out of Houston because we saw the same shots out of Katrina that folks who are 100% victimized by a natural disaster, they didn't ask for a hurricane, they were just trying to do it, on the heels of it, chose to go rob a, your business to go loot this store, to go steal from their neighbors, to go rape their children because they felt like victims. And we want to treat them as victims, what they're really is rebelling against God and against the laws of the nation. The media will call them victims. They'll never be called rebels. But we're not basing this on the media's conversation. It's when we're basing this on the word of God. Are they victims or are they rebels? Is my dad a victim or a rebel? When you don't live by God's financial plan and you have no money at the end of the month, are you, in, in this context, are you a victim or are you a rebel? Half of you may not be here next week. I get that. I love you. <laughs> Do you still love me? Circle yes or no. Now, the second part of repentance says this. Repentance is turning around and coming home. To repent literally means, in the original Greek, to change directions, to do a 180. That's what repent literally means, to turn around. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13 says this, whoever conceals their sins 
does not prosper. But the one who confesses and what? Confesses and not confesses or renounces. Not who confesses and goes on. The one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. See, confessing, folks, is not just acknowledging. Because you can confess and still not renounce or repent or turn around. I mean, worst case scenario, you can stand before a judge and say, oh, yeah, judge, yeah, I, I, I did that. And in the back of your mind or to your friends afterwards, you're still justifying or making excuses. You don't own it. You don't renounce it. You just go along because you think that's what's best in the moment. You know, 1 John Chapter 1, verse 9 talks about when you confess your sin, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us your sin. Judges chapter 10 in the Old Testament's got a whole story about a nation who rebelled against God. And after they confessed, God then gave them the fullness of his mercy and his grace. But they had to actually own it for their own good, not for his. And so all of that's going on. It's all throughout scripture. You know what's interesting? It was a side note, a thought that hit me. This is the same kind of practical stuff that you kind of got to do if you're going to AA or CR or NA. You never overcome whatever habit, hurt, or hang-up addiction you have in your life until you own it, right? Well, we have this addiction called sin that's messing up our lives. And until we own it and how sin plays out in our choices, we don't ever get fully recovered. We don't ever renounce it. See, it's not just, I'm sorry. It's not just, God, I'm sorry, and I promise I'll never do it again. You been there with me on that one? It's doing whatever it takes to renounce it. For some of you, I don't know what that means. It might mean you've got to go home and disconnect your internet today. Others of you, it might mean that you've got to go into your job and resign tomorrow because you're being asked to do immoral, unethical, sinful things just to keep that job to get the next paycheck. I don't know really what goes on in your situation. I got enough issues of my own, but I know what I've got to do if I'm going to own my own sin so that God will give me the fullness of his forgiveness. It's not just me saying, God, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. It's me saying, God, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I'm going to turn, and instead of going after that, I'm going after you, but you're over here, and that's over here, and in between are the consequences in my life. Repentance is changing direction and heading back home, and when you do, God always responds to that, which leads me then to number four. When plan A is wrecked, there is always a plan B. When plan A is wrecked, there is always a plan B. Now, it may not be exactly what you wanted because God's plan A was perfect and he designed it for you. Our choices, our behaviors, our sin wrecked it. But then God, out of his goodness, has a plan B. Well, in the son's case, the son gets a ring. He gets a piece of steak. He gets a robe. He gets new shoes. He doesn't get another shot at the, his dad's inheritance. For me... I'm kind of like the son. I got saved. I've been found. There's a part in heaven with my name on it, but there are things in my life that maybe God had for me to experience I'm never going to experience. Some of the mud in the pit might stay with us the rest of our lives, and those are called consequences. See, just because you tell God you're sorry, and even in the midst of full repentance, doesn't mean the memory of what you did is going to leave you. God will never hold it against you again. He's cast it in the sea of forgetfulness. You are unable to. Just because you've gone to him doesn't, and done this doesn't mean that you're still not going to lose your family. It doesn't mean that your liver is going to grow back. And out of God's goodness, that's why we always need a plan B. Because when plan A is wrecked, it's wrecked. It's not coming back. Some of you are going, David, I got no problem. I'm on plan R. I'm just grateful. <laughs> Sorry doesn't give us new brain cells. Just because you quit that doesn't mean that your marriage is going to be put back together again. Jeremiah 
chapter 18 has the story about a potter and a clay. Some of you familiar with that story? Even if you aren't, it's basically the same kind of thing. If you've ever gone to someone and watched a craftsman who's like a potter and he puts the clay up on the little wheel and he starts turning it and he's making something, not an ashtray, but something real. Every once in a while, there's a bad piece of clay in there. This is a master potter. He it somehow got mixed in the clay. It's not going to be just as he wanted it. And so what does the potter do? He literally has to break it all down again and remove the badness out of it and then take what he has remaining and build up as best he can according to his master capacity, his master ability. Using a biblical analogy with our lives, that's what Jeremiah chapter 18 does. For some of us folks, if you think about what that means and what God wants to do in our lives based on the decisions we've made, that sounds painful, doesn't it? It sounds scary. But here's what I want you to understand. God's plan B is always better than the world's plan A. See, whatever God makes is worthy of God's brand, God's stamp, God's title. And we have to be willing to let him remake us. Plan B, plan R, plan S, plan Q. This summer, we did the Psalm series. And in Psalm 51, we talked about David, man after God's own heart. And we, then we talked about David's issue with lust and how he had an affair that led to murder, that led to uh, an unwanted pregnancy, that led to all kinds of bad consequences, devastating consequences in the midst of his family. And David was forgiven. David even repented, but didn't bring Uriah back. It didn't restore Bathsheba's former marriage. It didn't change some of the behaviors of his children who saw their stepmom walking through the halls of the houseway and knew what had happened. And he lived out all kinds of consequences. Did God still love him? Yes. Did God still use him? He still shows up in the genealogy of Jesus. Jesus is still called a son of? But there was a whole lot of stuff that came out of one choice, one behavior, one night that affected his entire life, maybe his entire kingdom. He's still called a son of, he's still called a child of God. God still loves him. Jesus is still called a man who comes from the lineage of David. God doesn't, there's a plan B in there. And aren't you glad? Which leads me to my final thought. Jesus is literally waiting for us to come back. Now I'll give you a second to write that in. When you read that, you're thinking Jesus is literally waiting for us to come back. And you might be thinking, yeah, he's waiting for me to come back from all these stupid things I've done. Actually, I want you to read that differently. Jesus is literally waiting for us to come back. Are you with me? I, I sometimes hear people say, you know what? I can't, I can't wait for Jesus to return. This world is so evil. There's so much terrorism. There's so much immorality. There's so much ugliness. There's so much racial divide. I can't wait for Jesus to come back. I want you to know I can. I can wait for Jesus to come back. I beg Jesus to wait to come back. See, I got a sister that I love who grew up in the same house I did, went to the same church I did, has no interest in Jesus or his church. And recently I was talking to her about it and I just said, Cindy, you know. And she said, Dave, I do. And I said, Cindy, why not? And she said, maybe you've heard these words. Dave, I will. I'm just not ready yet. And I'm like, God, wait till she says yet. I don't want the ugliness and the racial discord and the terrorism and the pain of this world. I can live with more racial discord. I can live with more terrorism. I can live with immorality. I can't live with the thought of my sister spending eternity separated from you. God, wait till yet. As I'm in here talking to you this morning, there's a couple very good friends of mine sitting with my wife at our kitchen table. They are great friends. They have no interest in Jesus. They have no interest in his church. David and Tammy, you're some of our best friends. They're visiting from out of state. We love hanging out with you. Just don't talk about Jesus. And this morning, I'm writing in my prayer journal, God, I love these people. 
They are a wonderful married couple. They are hard workers. They pay their taxes. They, they give to charity. They've got great children. They love their children. They're monogamous in their marriage. God, what's it going to take for them to love you? How do I introduce some of my best friends to my very best friend? Jesus, what's it going to take? But Jesus, don't come back just because somebody else is sick of the evil in this world. Not yet. And Jesus is literally waiting for us to come back. 2 Peter 3.9 says these words, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some might understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Why? Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to, and there's that word that we read in Luke 15 this morning, everyone to come to. See, folks, no matter how deep in the weeds you might be, we have an incredibly loving and patient God who is waiting. We have an incredibly loving and patient God who is far more interested in restoring you than he is in punishing you. My question for you this morning is this. Is today the day you will come to your senses and change your direction and come home? And I want you to bow your heads. I'm not going to linger here very long, and I'm going to ask you to trust me for just a minute, and I'm not going to embarrass you. I have two questions for you. Some of you here this morning are doing the best you know how to be followers of Jesus, but you're stuck. And some of your stuckness is because of some of your choices. And you literally want to move from remorse to repentance and give God full control. Would you lift your hand up and back down? That's all you got to do. I'm going to pray for you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to include you in this prayer. Some of you here this morning have never thought about it, but it's time to come to your senses. It's time to stop making excuses. And it's time to run into the arms of the Father who loves you more than you could begin to imagine. And today, you want to say yes to Jesus and give him your life and repent for your sins. Can I see your hands up and back down? That's all you got to do. Yeah. God, thank you so much for your love and loving kindness. Thank you for your mercy. God, thank you for the truth of your word that transcends my age, my race, my political affiliation, my philosophical understandings. But I can come back to truth. God, for the folks here this morning who said we're endeavoring to follow Christ, but we're tired of just being remorseful. This morning, we want to be repentant. We're tired of just saying, I'm sorry. This morning, we want to turn around and come back home. God, these are people who are doing their best to follow you, but they're stuck. And the consequences from choices are mounting. And so, God, I pray for them this morning that the understanding they are gaining from your word in the initial conversation of this new series will bring them back up out of the weeds, out of the pit, out of the ditch and set them on a fresh course. You are guiding them and you're offering, here's plan B, here's plan C, whatever's appropriate in their lives. And then God, the other group of people who raised their hands and said, it's time to come to my senses that I have been trying to do life my own way and I'm ignoring God. It's time for me to ask God to come into my life and I want to say yes to Jesus this morning. If that was you, in the privacy of your own mind, just, re just repeat after me, Jesus, thank you for loving me and giving your life for me. Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin, for my choices and my behavior. Would you come into my life, wash away my sin and become my leader, my Lord, my friend, and my forgiver. Jesus, as I walk out of these doors this morning, would you lead me in a brand new direction? Ultimately, would you lead me home? My life is yours. And now, Father, I say thank you for sharing this experience with us. I say thank you for these folks. I say thank you for this church and for your goodness to us. And for any of you who prayed the second part of that prayer with me this morning, if you want to go back to the connection point 
after this service, or maybe up front, we have some prayer counselors who will be up front to take that a little further with you, or you can go back to the connection point and just say, hey, I raised my hand, and they have uh, some special things for you back there. God, we love you. We appreciate you. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.